Going pro or even hitting challenger may seem like a far-fetched dream to many, but some players are able to achieve both within shockingly small timeframes. For a certain player, that time was just two years to go from unranked to pro. And today, he joins us to impart his three most important rules that made this incredible accomplishment possible. Who exactly are we talking about? Golden Guardian's Chime. He had his breakout from being top two in his role in solo queue, lending him a spot in scouting grounds where he got picked up to play Academy as well as LCS. Not only is he an insane solo queue player, but right now he's currently playing on the Academy roster and at the making of this video, holds second place in the league with a 68% win rate. No small feat. But before we get into the guide, here's a video of you trying to rank up without skill capped. <laughs> Don't worry, we can fix that at skillcap.com. Link in the description below. Let's not delay any longer and get right into Chime's three rules to climb ranked as a support. Yeah, yeah. the first rule of climbing as a support is to know your role. You really have to know your role in every game according to jungle pathing and expand thinking beyond just your own matchups and train according to those bot paths. Um, to get to the next level, we need to think about the rest of the game and how it influences bot lane and your trades. Essentially, the first level of laning involves understanding how your matchup plays out, but the next level is understanding how other matchups in the game can influence your own lane and change your matchups, and subsequently the trades you need to take. For example, there are three different scenarios that can occur based on jungle pathing early on, and we need to know what to do in each of them. One, your jungler can path into your lane while the opposing jungler paths away. Essentially, this just means that you will have a jungler on bot side while the enemy will not. Two, your jungler paths away from your lane and the opponent's jungler paths to yours, meaning that you will not have a jungler and the enemy will. And finally, three, both junglers path towards the same side. This can mean that they both come bottom or that they both path away. First, it's critical to identify what kind of scenario is happening in your games. Let's talk about what each of these means for you. Normally, when you're in lane and take a trade with your opponent, you're going to take it at face value. Basically, this just means that if you came out on the better end of the trade, whether it's because of health, mana, or whatever resource, we would be happy. Chime wants you to know that due to those three different scenarios, this isn't necessarily true. In this same situation, if you had scenario two where your jungler pathed away and there's path towards bottom, we now have an issue. The enemy lane can push in a wave to our tower, call their jungler, and then dive us, while our jungler will be topside and unable to respond. Ultimately, what mattered here was losing any amount of health at all. The second a third party got involved, not taking a trade at all became better than taking a winning trade. On the opposite side of the coin, in scenario 1, if your jungler is pathing to you, taking even or slightly worse trades is actually very strong. Any amount of health loss on the enemy's side makes any gank or dive we receive more likely to work out. Now I know you're all thinking that your jungler will never gank you even if you do this, but it's an irrefutable fact that if you have a jungle advantage, your jungler is more likely to gank you here than the opponents. Anything is greater than 0% and the enemy jungler literally cannot gank you. As a second point, the juicier you make the gank look by doing this, you increase the odds your jungler will come. At the end of the day, we're just playing to improve our odds and this strategy is very consistent at doing so. In the third scenario, we can take trades at face value like you're probably used to doing. One small note here is that if both junglers are pathing towards your lane, it's the jungle matchup that determines which trades are winning. For example, if one team has Zin Zhao and the other a Shivana, the team with Zin is going to be heavily incentivized to take even trades because Zin beats Shivana in the 1v1 and that's the tiebreaker here. Okay. So that's the simplest form of the concept that anyone can use. But let's see how Chime uses an advanced version in pro play. Just how junglers 1v1s determine a tiebreaker in some scenarios, when both junglers are relatively even, we look for more tiebreakers. In this case, Ryze is capable of outpushing Azir here and getting move first. Chime goes mid with his jungler to exert pressure so that Ryze can push the wave and get him a timer to move towards bottom. This allows him to set up vision in the enemy's bot side jungle to prep for a dive. And even though they know that Udyr is here, they are completely unfazed, as they know their mid is here first. Chime hits a nasty flash hook onto the enemy ADC, securing the kill, denying Varus a ton of farm, and swinging the game in their favor. His understanding of other matchups in this game, not just his own, is what made this play possible. Change your laning mindset to include factors outside of your lane, and you can open up plays just like this too. Let's move on to the second rule now. The second rule is tracking your counterpart. 
for example, bad roams will work in solo queue, but to take it to the next level, you really have to learn that it's all about knowing your timers and taking turns. Especially at the pro level, you need to be super aware of when you're showing on vision and tell that to your teammates. To break this down further, he's basically saying that anyone can just roam. If you want to, you can leave lane to go towards top and gank someone, but you're not free from the consequences of showing on the map elsewhere. What the opponent should do now is just crash the wave onto your ADC and dive them, making your top lane play worthless as you lose just as much, if not more, on the other side of the map. In solo queue, will this punish always happen? Of course not. But again, we want to play for the best possible odds, and we just shouldn't give any chance for the enemy to win, even if they won't take it. Good roams will just make you much more consistent. Let's take a look at how Chime does it. He and his ADC work on pushing in a bot wave and then take an early reset. Out of base, he runs towards mid. Even though his mid laner is chunked incredibly low and lost his flash moments ago, he still wants to make a play. With the help of his jungler, he ganks TF, gets a flash, and Chime flashes in to follow to secure the kill and first blood with it. So what made this a good realm, and what can we learn from it? Let's listen to what he has to say about this. Thresh and lane usually should always have push. We crash on four waves. I got a timer over Tom Kench because then they have to crash their wave. So I have like 15 seconds basically above him to do something, which means like it'd be greedy to go top, but I can look around mid and since they just got my mid laner's flash. I know that they need to crash the wave before, like, so that they can actually get an advantage out of it. So I called my jungler here, and then we just pincered their mid laner and killed him while he tried to crash the wave because I have a turn right now and Tom Kench is stuck in base. There was a lot of info here, so let's break it down. Basically, being able to push in the wave due to his lane matchup gave him time to do something on the map. He got a turn because Tom is relegated to staying bot and pushing the next wave. What he mentioned is that he knew this was only about a 15 second window to do something, and that because of it, it would be too greedy to go top. The main reason being that it just takes a long time to walk all the way up there and get back bottom, and at that point his ADC could be punished while he's gone. His window is only as long as it takes for the enemies to set up counterplay. He wants to take his turn and not give Tom one to do anything. Because of this, he takes the roam that requires less time, mid, and also buys boots to cut the time down even more. The big takeaway here is that even if you can identify your roam timer, it's very important to also identify how long that timer lasts. Lots of players overstay on the roams and let their team take the fall for them. Things like buying boots, taking blast cones to save time, and selective pathing can all make you get way more bang for your buck. Additionally, call out when the enemies support bases with tons of pings and you can potentially avoid your mid laner dying like TF did here. Again, it won't work every time, but you will increase the odds and that's what matters when you're trying to climb. At pro level, if Tom had called Thresh's roam timer, this first blood wouldn't have happened. Let's move on to the third and final rule. Uh, the third rule is thinking of bot lane as a triangle. Um, so space is like a huge resource and you need to know how much space you have and how much you can work with when it comes to protecting your ADC and pressuring the enemy ADC. Uh, so like most people usually only pay attention to the enemy team, but paying just as much to your own can help you avoid a lot of bad engages and like consequent frustration, not feeling like that engage was followed up on. Um, in the same way, you can punish the enemy team when you realize their spacing is poor and it creates windows for you to win the game. For those of you who don't know what the concept of a bot lane triangle is, let's just explain really quick. While bot lane is a 2v2 lane, there might be brief instances where the lane acts more like a 1v2. We want to draw a line from our ADC to an enemy target, and a line from us to the same enemy. If the line is close to the same distance and makes an isosceles triangle, you know that you'll have follow-up should you engage. If we draw a triangle to a target and the lines are different distances, it's usually not a good time or target to go in on, as your ADC will have a very hard time following up. On top of paying attention to our team's triangles, we want to look at the enemies and see if they leave us any room to abuse them. Let's take a look at Chime's games to see how he uses an overstep from his opponent. The enemy jungler is looking to wrap around for a gank or dive right now, and the enemy mid also has first move on a roam towards bottom. Because of this, Rakan is posturing aggressively to try and combo. However, in doing so, he makes a critical spacing error. If we draw a triangle for Jin and Rakan to Thresh here, Jin's line is definitely longer than what would be ideal. If we do the same for Aphelios and Thresh onto Rakan, the lines are basically identical in distance because they're right on top of each other. Because of this, Chime immediately aims to go for a hook. When the engage starts, look at how far away Jin is. He can't participate at all. 
I guess like yeah, knowing when someone is overplaying their hand when you're on the weak side, um, and punishing like small mistakes like that. So in this instance, we're concepts too far forwards, even though like they have four members around us and we only have three. So like we are on like the back foot, but he tries to make too much space. And if you can get a fast play off like that, um, it's really good to like just stuff their play. Because Chime recognized the spacing error of his opponents immediately, it opened up a one shot onto the enemy support and shut down their play instantly. Him maintaining a good triangle here with his teammate and noticing the mispositioning of his opponents turned a bad situation into a good one. To recap, the three rules that Chime recommends everyone to use are one, know your role according to other lanes and use teammates as tiebreakers when it comes to deciding how you're going to trade and force plays. Two, track your counterpart and use it to make aggressive plays and shut down theirs. And three, use the bot lane triangle to punish and protect your ADC. So you might be asking yourself, why go to skillcap.com to improve when I could just watch YouTube guides or play the game? Well, let me show you. Let's say you're a support who's struggling to climb the ladder. Not only would you get over 40 site exclusive courses for support, but maybe really what you've been struggling with is trading as support. Well, we got you covered with six different courses breaking down how to trade as a support player. Not only do we have the largest catalog of guides for League of Legends in the entire world with over 1500 videos to watch, but these are then curated by the top coaches and players into courses on every skill and topic you need to master in order to truly improve and climb the ladder. If all of this wasn't enough, we haven't even touched on our catalog of over 700 smurf commentaries, where a challenger expert shows you how to climb out of your rank and you're guaranteed to get any questions answered by them directly. Not to mention, we're the only service to offer a rank improvement guarantee. If you don't climb at least 5 divisions while actively using Skillcap, you can claim a refund, no questions asked. So what are you waiting for? Head to Skillcap.com and get the rank you've always wanted. Link in the description below. Thanks so much to Chime for helping create this guide, and for all of the great advice that he offered. Make sure to follow him as well as the official Skillcap Twitter if you haven't already. Until next time, thanks for watching, and good luck on your climb.